So I will say good afternoon. I'll call the February 16th meeting of the Ag Finance and Policy Committee to order. This meeting will be held in accordance with House Rule 10.01. Roll call, Mr. Smith, please. Chair Sundin. Present. Vice Chair Vang. Present. Representative Anderson. Representative Burkle. Burkle present. Representative Eklund. Representative Hanson R. Hanson R here. Representative Hanson J. Hanson J present. Representative Cleavorn. Cleavorn present. Representative Lippert. Lippert present. Representative Lewick. Lewick present. Representative Miller. Present, Rep sorry, I had mute, I'm present. Representative Nelson. Nelson present. Representative Thompson. We have a quorum, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, I would like to get the approval of the minutes. Uh, Representative Miller, do you uh, have a motion for us? Uh, yes, I have reviewed the minutes and I make a motion that we approve the minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, you heard the motion. Any questions or corrections on those minutes? Hearing none, seeing none. All those in favor signify uh, approval of the minutes by saying aye. 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 Okay, that motion prevails as the minutes are adopted. Uh, we got a pretty full agenda today, but hopefully we have adequate time to do it all justice. Again, uh, all the items are related, so hopefully we will reduce redundancy and maximize our time. First up, we uh, get an update from the Rural Finance Authority on the uh, status of their loan programs. Uh, target time is just a few minutes here, 15 minutes, and uh, the department submitted a report that you were provided, which includes information about the RFA loans that they administer, as well as uh, current loan issuance and uh, projection of when the funds will be exhausted. This is one of the tools the department has used to help farmers navigate COVID and the recent drought. drought. We have about 15 minutes, so uh, Mr. McDivitt, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and begin. Chair Sundin, members, I'm uh, Matt McDevitt. I'm the Ag Finance Supervisor for the Department of Agriculture. So I will share my screen and we will go through a short presentation. Uh, feel free to ask questions as we go along. Okay, so the uh, RFA for any that are unaware, basically um, the way we're funded is we, we get appropriations to um, or authorization to uh, purchase bonds uh, on the open market. So we use those authorizations for a number of different programs, um, beginning farmer and seller assisted, uh, agricultural improvement, livestock expansion, and restructure. We sell a mixture of uh, taxable and uh, non-taxable bonds. Our uh, last authorization was uh, 50 million, which was uh, back in 2020 of which we uh, sold $25 million worth of bonds um, in September of 2020. So we're still working off that uh, chunk of money right now. We also do uh, the Aggie bond program, which is a federal uh, tax exempt bond program. And then we have a, a dedicated revolving account for loan programs such as disaster, livestock equipment, value added ag product, agroforestry, Microloan, Farm Opportunity, and Methane Digester. Just kind of an overview of uh, the authorizations I was just speaking of, kind of gives you the, the history from uh, 86 to uh, 2020. No, I'm not gonna read them all off to you, but if you just wanna take a look at that. RFA uh, program, Kind of high level overview here. So 86 to uh, 2021, we've uh, issued 3,801 loans, totaling uh, a little over 360 million. We have taken losses on only 21 loans, which represents 0.002% uh, of the total. So uh, overall our, our risk uh, is, is pretty good. We, we return quite well on that. We currently have 636 active loans with a balance of just over 94 million. Recent bond loan activity, 
Uh, fiscal year 18, we did 109 loans for uh, just over 21 million. 2019, 122 loans for 24 million. We had a little bit of a dip in uh, 2020, 2021, and that's purely due to the COVID type thing. So uh, 94 loans for 17 million in 20 and 75 for uh, almost 11 million in 2021. So far through fiscal year 22, we have 21 loans for um, almost 3 million. We, we, have, we have quite a bit in the hopper here though. So we, we expect this year to at least rebound up to the 20, probably 2021 or 2020 level. Current bond loans we do have approved that, that are not uh, on the books yet. Uh, we have 60 loans for about 11 million. Um, with uh, our bonds that are sold and funds available to make loans, we have 16 million and current bonding authority, 25 million. So how does the RFA work? We, our loan programs, we participate with local lenders. Generally speaking, we take 45% of a loan. So the loan, the lender does most of the paperwork and um, we, they close the loan uh, with their funds, but then we buy our 45% from them after the loan closes. So in, in more, more common type of situations, if there was a $100,000 loan, they're going to take 65,000 of it, we take 45,000 of it. So um, when the borrower makes their repayments on their loans, they pay the lender and then the lender pays us. Uh, we do have a five-year prepayment penalty after that, they can pay it off as, as quickly as they like. So this, this works out pretty well to cut down on some of our administration in that they provide most of the paperwork in their approval process. We, we generally, if they approve, we approve. I don't know, maybe there's about one every three years or so that uh, we'll have a loan that they'll approve that we won't, but it's, it's pretty rare. So uh, we wanted to get a little bit into the disaster recovery loan as it kind of pertained to the drought. So, um, to qualify for that, it needs to either be a state or federal declared disaster uh, or as a das disaster area as determined by the RFA board. That was uh, somewhat recently added a couple of years back. Um, the idea here is to help farmers affected by recent disasters for farm expenses not covered by insurance. It's used to help clean up, replace feedstock or other puts or repair on buildings. It can be used to purchase watering systems during a drought or disaster and cover loss of revenue when there's a contagious disease, uh, whether that disease be animal or uh, human disease. So that, that human part got added there with COVID so we could uh, access some of the funds for people who were struggling with their um, operations due to issues with COVID. That loan is also limited to 45% of a qualifying loan to a maximum of uh, 200,000 um, from the RFA. We do these loans at a 0% interest rate, and it's interest only required in the first two years, which in a sense then just makes it no payments for two years. So there uh, is no maximum net worth right now and collateral is negotiable. So we are um, quite flexible with this here. I mean, kind of the idea is we wanna be able to make this that it'll, it'll fit a lot of different situations and not have a whole lot of uh, hoops to jump through. So disaster loans we have issued, it, it's really picked up as, as you would imagine here in the last few years uh, due to COVID and the drought. So 2020 to 2021, we did 30 disaster loans for 2.2 million. Those were primarily uh, COVID, but there was, a, there was a chunk of some that had to do with some storms we, we had a couple of years ago. Um, 2022, Fiscal year, so that's uh, starting in July. Uh, pretty much every loan we've gotten in has been a drought-related loan um, for this year. So right now we uh, have 12 loans for uh, 1.45 million. We uh, continue to get lots of calls on these. Um, we, you know, they they kind of come in fairly steadily, and we we expect that to uh, continue here as the year progresses. That is the end of my short presentation. I. Um, am available for questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. McDevitt. Uh, any questions uh, from the committee? Uh, Representative Burkle, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just one question on the, uh, the disaster assistance definitions. I'm just curious, water systems would include wells, correct? I've had calls on wells back in my district and I'm just curious about what you mean by water systems. How would that be defined? Mr. McDevitt, please. Sure, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Burkle. Um, yeah, we can do, we have pretty broad range of what we can do as far as where people are having issues with water, whether it be systems or, or drilling a new well or things of that nature. So yes, definitely. Thank you, anything further, Representative Burkle? No, nothing further, thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, uh, Representative Anderson, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, question for, is my audio solving bad? You're breaking up a little bit, but bear with, we'll bear with you. I'm having issues with my computer. I may have to shut down. I was just going to ask you a quick question about the application process for these RFA loans. Is it an online application, or would you characterize it as more older technology? Mr. McDevitt, did you get that, please? Uh, Mr. Chair, no, I didn't quite catch it all. One more time, uh, Representative Anderson. I'm sorry about that. Um, just wondering about the, the application process. Is there an online application? Does it go smoothly? Or are you using you know, what some would call old technology in, the, in this whole process? Okay, we'll try again, Mr. McDevitt. Okay, I got it. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Anderson. Uh, yeah, application. So we, we do have an application online. It, it is a paper one. They, they usually fill that out when they're filling out um, other bank um the bank application and other documents so they they do that with their banker and then that's part of the package the bank sends over to us so the application for a disaster loan is i think it's seven or eight pages but a lot of it's just kind of um informational there there isn't a ton to fill out probably would take the you know an average person 10 minutes to fill it out at the most okay thank you any further questions Okay, thanks. Uh, Representative Anderson, I'd suggest if, if, if before we move on to some of the uh, other concerns that you're going to speak to, could you get a, a better audio? It would be appreciated. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, moving along. Uh, thank you, Mr. McDevitt. That's helpful information. Up next, we have uh, House File 3081. It's going to provide funding to expedite RFA loan processing. Um, House file 3081, Representative Swazinski uh, is going to appropriate money to expedite rural finance authority loan processing. I already said that, but welcome to uh, Representative Swazinski. Let's get your bill moved before you begin. Representative Anderson, would you like to move House file 3081 to be laid over for future consideration? Okay, we did not hear from him. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, this is Representative Lewick. Uh, I would uh, I would move that bill. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Lewick moves uh, House File 3081 to be laid over for future consideration. Uh, Representative Swazinski, your bill is before us. We have about uh, 15 minutes for the bill. Please tell us about it and let's hear from witnesses, please. Certainly, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Sundin, and thank you, members of the Ag Committee. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to come before you um, here on Zoom. Uh, this bill is a, a pretty straightforward bill that I think uh, is really reacting to the you know, the growing need uh, as agriculture transitions. And you know, this bill particularly focuses in uh, to the RFA and the ability to process uh, the paperwork uh, that for the loans and the applications. Um, uh, and for the credits uh, within this program to, to allow these staff people to really keep up with the workload. Um, you know, we, you know, as a Republican, you know, adding staff to the state government has never been a real priority, uh, but I, I will agree that at times uh, it is necessary. And I believe that this is one of those times. Uh, this is a very focused program. Uh, this is a, has the potential to be a temporary program or get grown uh, into the future. But um, as of right now, um, this agency gets inundated uh, sometimes seasonally, but it just inundated with these applications. And the goal of this uh, bill is to make sure that the RFA has the tools, has the staff uh, to make sure that young farmers have an opportunity uh, to uh, grow and young farmers have the opportunity to uh, 
um, uh, be successful in their operation in this uh, in this very uh, quite volatile agricultural market that we're in. Um, you know, House File 3081 uh, just bore from a conversation that I had uh, with some folks that were concerned about some of the, the wait times and the workload uh, within this particular area in state government. And uh, this bill, uh, I believe, moves forward about $80,000 to help alleviate that load uh, to make the farmers' lives easier. I know we have a number of folks that would like to speak on behalf of this bill, and uh, we thank you for your, your, your time and uh, consideration. Thank you. First up, we have Alexa Swadzinski. Um, there's a family uh, relationship here. Uh, welcome to the committee. I'm going to ask the testifiers to limit their comments to two minutes or less. Uh, Alexa Swazinski, welcome to the committee. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexa Swazinski. Um, I'm a farmer in Lincoln County, Minnesota. A little bit about me and my relationship with the RFA. Uh, I began farming in 2019, renting land for my father. I soon came to realize that it was unsustainable for us, for me to be taking away production acres from him and that I would need to begin the search of finding new landlords. This proved difficult as most landlords have long-standing relationships with their current tenants. Uh, in the summer of 2022, an auction was announced for a piece of land only a few miles away from our main farm site. When the land was sold, the majority of the ground was purchased by a local family operation, but one part parcel of the sale was purchased by an older gentleman who had no intentions of farming it himself. Deciding he may be, good, be a good landlord to pursue, I spoke with a cousin of mine about the opportunity as I knew they have a few non-family landlords and I wanted to discuss ways to approach him. That is when I first heard about the beginning farmer tax credit program through the RFA. My cousin told me about how he leveraged the program to assist him in lease negotiations, as well as the farmer business management course that he enrolled, that he's enrolled with, um, with Brad Verley of Minnesota West Communi Community and Technical College as part of his continuing education. Using the beginning farmer tax credit program, I was able to enter into a three-year lease agreement with my first non-family landlord. Uh, and leveraging the program again, I'm excited to be adding an additional landlord beginning this spring. I believe the RFA is an asset to every farmer in the state of Minnesota and should be given all the tools they require to assist as many producers as smoothly and expediently as possible. And that's why I support the hiring of additional RFA personnel. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your clear testimony. That's great. Next up, we have Brent Kelsey from Compere Financial. Mr. Kelsey, please. Thank you, Chair Cindy and the members of the committee. Uh, my name is Brent Kelsey and I serve as a principal credit officer with Compere Financial where I've been for 11 years. I also operate my own farm and personally use the, the, the RFA program. By way of background, Compere Financial is a member-owned cooperative providing credit and other financial services to our farmer customers located in parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois. Compere is part of the farm credit system created by Act of Congress the mission to support rural communities and agriculture with reliable, consistent credit and financial services. Within Minnesota, Compere has more than 25,000 farmer clients and over $5.2 billion in total loan volume. We serve all types and all sides of agriculture from multi-generational farms to young and beginning farmers to those serving new and emerging markets. On behalf of Compere, as well as Ag Country Financial Services, the other farm credit cooperatives serving Minnesota agriculture, I am here today to speak in support of House File 3081. In my role at Compere, I work with all sizes of operations, but many being small beginning and emerging farmers. With my knowledge of the state and federal government programs, I have become a sort of government loan specialist with our clients uh, and a liaison between Compere, our clients, and the different agencies. I field a lot of questions and work with our beginning farmers to try to make their experience working with the government agencies as smooth as possible. Over the last 11 years, it has been a pleasant experience working with the RFA. However, in the last few months, we have experienced considerable processing delays. Um, here appreciates the support and legis the legislature has historically provided for the lending programs offered to farmers through the Rural Finance Authority at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Since 2012, Compere's participated loan balance with the RFA has more than tripled, going from 11.3 billion or million to nearly 36 million. 
This may not sound like a lot in the grand scheme of things, but we have to remember the majority of these are small loans for small beginning farmers with an average size of just $129,000. There are several loan programs, but by far the majority of our participation loans are with small beginning farmers on purchases. These participations are an excellent arrangement with the clients because RFA interest rates for the beginning farmer program are currently 2%. When we combine this with current market rates, the blended rate makes the cash flows uh, far more feasible to beginning farmers. We also have the ability to participate with the USDA Farm Service Agency to get an even lower blended rate, which we often do. While we appreciate all the efforts the MDA and the RFA staff to process loan applications on a timely basis, in recent months we have observed processing times slowing and understand there is currently a backlog. Delays in getting loans approved can impact our farmers' interest in utilizing the RFA programs. In the past, the participation approval process took a matter of days, while recently we have experienced timeframes in excess of 10 weeks. Because of this, we have had clients cancel their participation before it was even closed, or others who have just decided not to even pursue the RFA participation fi or financing because of unloan timelines. Uh, therefore, Compere supports Representative Sedinsky's uh, legislation that would provide a supplemental appropriation to the MDA to hire additional staff to assist with processing loan applications. Thank you all for the opportunity to testify today. I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Kelsey. Please stand by. Next up, we have uh, Stu Laurie from the Minnesota Farmers Union. Are there any uh, family connections with the uh, author of the bill before you continue? Unfortunately for me, there is not uh, 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 Chair Sundin, but uh, uh, Stu, Stu Laurie, uh, Government Relations Director for Minnesota Farmers Union, and here to express our strong support for Rep. Swazinski's bill and giving the RFA more money to administer this really nation-leading program. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of what I can do is echo and confirm what Alexa uh shared well and that's what's experienced by being experienced by but by our members as well you know to state what's obvious you know access to credit and that financing is a central challenge for in particular uh new and emerging farmers and the rfa is an exceptional tool and we're really lucky to have it in minnesota that helps uh young farmers overcome that um what i can say too for mr mcdevitt's team you know they're not just taking applications in from lenders, right? They're providing a lot of hands-on expertise. I can say from my experience at Farmers Union, when a farmer calls me and says, hey, I'm having trouble with a lender, I can't find credit. Oftentimes they're like in Alexa's situation where they know that a piece of land was sold or they see an opportunity and you need to jump on that, right? And, and I tell them, call Matt, call his team, and they have conversations, they help through, they find participating lenders, and all of that takes a lot of time. Um, uh, the other thing I'll say to Representative Anderson's question is I have heard from members when we raised the prospect of putting actually an online portal that that would be helpful. And I think that's something that we could expand and expedite those applications with additional uh, uh, resources. You know, what, what producers have told me is, hey, everything else I do is online. And when I apply for that program, I need to print everything out, <laughs> which, you know, some younger folks, you know, might not even have a printer. And so I think there is um, merit there. And the final thing I'll say is I think the RFA is really, you know, a treasure. It's nation leading. I talked to a colleague from uh, Colorado the other day who flew in to meet with Matt McDevitt. I was, I was kind of offended that I didn't get a lunch out of the deal, but uh, he was coming to learn about the RFA program and try to build on that across the country. So I think this is a good model to build on. Uh, this is a good bill to do that. And I'm proud to share our support and happy to stand for questions as well. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Lurie. Next up, we have Amber Hansen-Glazer uh, with the Minnesota Farm Bureau. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Amber Glazer. I'm the Public Policy Director for Minnesota Farm Bureau. I just wanna echo the comments that have already been made and offer Farm Bureau support for this bill. We appreciate Representative Swidinski bringing this forward. As you've heard uh, very clearly, the RFA offers a lot of important tools for farmers, especially for our young and beginning farmers um, that, that may need some of these extra tools as they get underway. So just wanna reiterate Farm Bureau support for this and make sure the RFA has the tools they need to continue to effectively and efficiently uh, work with their client base. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to all the testifiers. Are there any questions from uh, the committee members? 
That must mean there's a very thorough explanation of the bill and great testifiers. Uh, any closing comments uh, before we lay the bill over, Representative Swadzinski? No, just thank you, uh, Chair Sandine. Appreciate the opportunity to come before the committee and uh, have a great rest of the day. Okay, Th thank you, sir. Uh, House file 3081 is laid over. Okay, next up, Bob, I have a bill on drought system assistance for uh, livestock and specialty crops. Uh, House file 3420, Vice Chair Bang, can you take the gavel? Of course, Mr. Chair. Uh, so we have about 50, 55 minutes for the bill before we vote. Uh, to Chair Sunding, please go ahead and move your bill and feel free to begin. Okay, I will move uh, House File 3420 to be recommended to be referred to the Ways and Means Committee. All right. I'd like to make a few introductory comments before moving the DE1 amendment. Uh, members, today we're taking up drought relief measures to assist Minnesota farmers who were negatively impacted by the historic drought we experienced last year, which still continues. Since uh, at least last July, Governor Walls and several people uh, gathered here today have been advocating uh, for aid to producers who experienced devastating impacts of the drought. Thousands of Minnesota farmers experienced real economic set setbacks last year because of the drought, but some had it much worse than others. These funds will target the most severely impacted counties who were de designated D4 drought first. Uh, these funds won't make uh, every farmer whole, but it will help uh, with a significant uh, bill or an additional expense caused by the drought, and especially for those who need the assistance most. This is an issue that crosses political party lines. I'd like to begin by thanking all the members for offering input and to the Vice Chair Vang uh, and the department for all the work on the Delete All Amendment. Uh, we're balancing providing timely assistance to all effective farmers with public and legislative accountability. And I think it's a reasonable and responsible, responsive solution. Uh, with that, I will move uh, the H. 3420 DE1 amendment. All right, Mr. Okay, Mr. Very, Go ahead, Mr. Chair. Okay, very briefly, this puts some additional parameters on the appropriation moving through the amendment that number one amends current statute regarding eligibility for RFA loans by reducing the farm income threshold to 20% of a farmer's income in that year, down from 50% over three years. It, uh, number secondly, it provides uh, five million to the uh, department for grants and five million to the RFA loan program to eligible farmers for drought-related expenses incurred between four one twenty one and five one twenty two. Thirdly, it requires the department to give preference to those who farm in counties classified as D four in whole or in part during. 2021, followed by D2 and D3 farmers. The department uh, would award grants at random if applications exceed available funds for eligible D4 farmers, followed by eligible D2 and D3 farmers. Uh, it also establishes some direction on how the funding should be used to ensure different types of farmers can access the assistance. Uh, there's a $1 million each in is set aside for livestock producers and specialty crop producers. And 500,000 is set aside for farmer market vendors who sell livestock or specialty crops. The remainder is for any of those groups. The commissioner may reallocate money reserved based on demand and may award unreserved dollars to any eligible livestock farmer or specialty crop producer. And lastly, it does direct the department to do outreach to emerging farmers. That's uh, a summary of the amendment. Uh, I appreciate your support. So we have uh, some amendments to the DE1 amendment, but I also see we have a number of people who signed up to testify. And so we will start with the testimony first, since it might be related to those amendments, and then we will go on to the amendments. Uh, we have six people who signed up, uh, folks. Uh, we're asked to keep comments to two minutes or less, and so we can get through the entire list. Uh, 
Commissioner Peterson, uh, please state your name for the record and feel free to begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. And for the record, uh, my name is uh, Tom Peterson, uh, uh, Commissioner of Agriculture. And I uh, just wanna really thank the committee and uh, Chair Sundin for uh, work that we've been doing uh, on this bill. Um, this was an effort that we uh, brought forward after, uh, you know, as I've mentioned already in the state that 80% of the state at one time was in uh, se severe drought, you know, 50% was in extreme drought. And of course, 10% uh, was in exceptional drought. And so we still think this is a need. I continue to take calls uh, even this week from farmers who, uh, as I said, this uh, bill would help them pay a bill or two and send a message to them that we're committed to helping those specialty crop uh, and livestock farmers across the state. And uh, I would mention that the department, this is Chair Sundin's bill. Uh, the department has been working on a bill that also includes uh, the DNR uh, drought relief package that I believe uh, Representative Hansen is continuing to work on. And, and our administration's position is to have those two bills uh, at some point maybe marry together or travel together. Um, but I appreciate the work on this and we do have uh, uh, folks uh, here to answer questions and uh, work through this as best we can. At the end of the day, I wanna work with everybody to get this bill passed and to have it work for folks uh, because we needed people to use it. And so appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Commissioner. Next, we have Stu Lori from Minnesota Farmers Union. Please state your name for the record and begin. Thank you, Chair Bang. Uh, Stu Lori with Minnesota Farmers Union and here to express uh, our strong support for a drought package and advancing it early. I appreciate uh, Chair Sundin, your leadership on this in particular and everyone else's work to make this a strong bill that can move early and get out to help folks before the start of spring. Um, I don't know if he's gonna be able to join us, but the a dairy farmer who's next up to testify, he had something come up, uh, Bob Silton, and he's in Chair Sundin's district. You know, he called me earlier this week and he's gonna run out a feed in a month. And he doesn't know how he's gonna buy new feed, which is more expensive. Uh, than, than he's used to paying due to the fact that it wasn't just Minnesota experiencing drought uh, conditions, it was the entire Western United States, which just makes this all the more uh, challenging. His, his, his farm has been in business in, in, in Carleton County for 136 years. This would mean a lot to his family and to that business. You know, building on the kind of statistics that the commissioner shared and that uh, his team uh, puts together well. I can just share a couple more stories. Like, you know, last night was on a call with uh, with another farmers union member who sold half his dairy herd and is working to keep the other half. Um, again, due to the drought. And this morning, I got a call from another member who had a specialty crop, aronia berries, that got burnt out by the drought. Folks might not have heard about it. He kind of sold me on them. Told me I needed to start putting them in, putting them in my smoothies but they had it completely get, get, get burned out and he's out, um, you know, the 10 to $15,000 that he was counting on um, there um, with that crop alone. So um, this is really important. It's important to those specialty crop and livestock producers. We continue to see merit and we really appreciate your work to move this forward and, and to do so quickly. So thank you and happy to stick around for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Laurie. Uh, next we have is Robert Sill Tandon. Uh, Robert, please state your name for the record and begin. Madam Chair, Chair. Uh, Madam Chair uh, Rep uh, Mr. Laurie indicated that he was not available. Okay, my apologies. Next we have is Liz Dwyer. Liz, please uh, state your name for the record and uh, begin. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Mr. Chair, committee, thank you for having me today. Uh, my name is Liz DeWire here with the Land Stewardship Project. I run Dancing the Land Farm in Clearwater, Minnesota with my husband and our young daughter. I organically raise a vast variety of market veggies, cut flowers, eggs, pastured lamb, goat, pork, and fiber. We started the 2021 season to be our biggest year yet. So we had 100 CSA members. We were vending at five farmers markets supplying two regional wholesalers with both produce and flowers, and we were supplying local co-ops and a handful of restaurants. By the beginning of July, our well was sucking bubbles and we were unable to keep up with watering. 
By late July, what crops were in the ground were withering. By early August, we'd stopped all but two farmers markets and were unable to maintain any of our other accounts. By late July, we had to end our CSA eight weeks early because we didn't have enough to give and what little we had, we needed to send to our remaining two markets to try to make a little bit of money. In August as well, we had to send lambs and goats to butcher well before finish weights, months before we normally would because our pasture was done. By October, we had to stop paying our one employee who understood, but is still uncertain if she will understood after such a, if she'll return after such a hard year with unreliable income, which would be years worth of investment into a highly skilled person lost. By November, my husband took another job to try to make ends meet, and we started applying for food stamps and county aid to help pay for our daughter's preschool, which is demoralizing because those applications make you feel like a criminal for being poor. The proof process is exhausting and inefficient, and so far the applications haven't even gone through, and we've had to restart the process three times due to issues on the county's end. By December, we drained our personal savings accounts to pay for the most outstanding of our debts, to buy hay and feed for the winter, and to buy seeds and supplies for 2022, most of which we tossed into the Iona credit card, hoping we would catch it when it fell with New Year's CSA sales, but so far sales are way down. We lost over $100,000 in revenue in 2021, which is enormous for a small farm with thin, thin margins. And as demoralizing as all of that is, I felt okay because I knew that we were in the same boat as every farmer around us. But as I have watched dozens of new center pivots go into the commodities fields near us over the winter, I realized that many of my neighbors have already been made whole by crop insurance and easy access to disaster payments, and we are not in the same boat. Our farm feeds thousands of families in our community, and because of last year, we can't even afford to fix our insufficient well let alone be made whole because there is no meaningful aid for specialty growers like me. Our story is harsh and I know we are not the only ones feeling it. Many farmers are still struggling from this past season. The need is great and I am appreciative that the rapid relief grants would be non-competitive and ask that you do support payments of $10,000 per application. It is honestly a drop in the bucket of our need, but we who feed our communities, who guard and protect soil and water and the possibility of a future for all of our descendants are desperate. And this, this is exactly how food systems break. While these funds will not make up for all the costs the season incurred, these grants and loan payments will help keep more farmers on the land, stewarding soils and feeding our communities. So thank you. Thank you for hearing my story today and I will be around for questions. Thank you, Mrs. Story, for your testimony. I really appreciate you coming here today to share your story. Uh, next we have is Miles Huschel. Uh, please state your name for the record and begin. Thank you, Vice Chair. Chair Sundin and members of the committee, I'm Miles Kishel, a third generation beef rancher in North Central Minnesota, closest to the town of Nimrod. I also serve as the Northeast District Director for Minnesota Farm Bureau. I'll expand on the written testimony that our state president, Dan Glossing, has submitted to this committee and can be found in your packet. This has been a very difficult year for many farms and ranches across not only Minnesota, but across the West as extreme drought has and continues to drive every decision we make on the upcoming year. I've spoken with many producers who feel this is the worst drought that have had to face and are certain that the drought is not over. I know producers who were forced to sell their entire herds when they ran out of pasture. I know many producers that bought very expensive hay to feed their cattle with the ultimate question that it could bankrupt them, but the cost of losing generations of genetics and heritage was more than we could bear. On our ranch, we saw hay production decrease by over two thirds and sold off cattle to try and preserve what little forage we had. When we were unable to bring in the amount of hay needed to feed our cattle this winter, we were forced to haul our cattle out of state to sustain them until we can bring them home. My story is like many of the Farm Bureau members I represent and the continuing fear of the drought lasting well into 2022 has many producers facing drastic decisions. Farmers and ranchers don't expect the relief to make them whole, but the rapid relief grants will help with challenges facing producers that is out of our control. And the needed RFA loans can help target where it is needed most such as feed assistance, water hauling, wells, fencing supplies, and other resources that we desperately need on our farms and ranches. Thank you again, Vice Chair and Chair Sundin for bringing this bill forward. And we look forward to working with the MBA on providing relief for our farmers and ranchers affected by this unprecedented drought. I'll be available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chrishell for your testimony. Uh, next we have is Chris Wollum. Please state your name for the worker record and begin. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Wallum. I am the legislative chair for the Minnesota State Cattlemen's Association. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and committee, and thank you for your time. I'm here to show support for House File 3420. Um, as the Minnesota State Cattle Association, we would like to show our support for this bill. Uh, the money is sorely needed by some of our producers, and it was needed yesterday. 
uh, we talked to, I talked to people from across the state on a regular basis and people that were in the D4 status in northern Minnesota, um, they ended up, like Miles said, they ended up moving a lot of their cattle out of the state because they had no feed. Other people spent all the money they could to buy feed to try to keep as many of their livestock as they could. Uh, part of the problem is, is some of this feed, the quality because of the drought is not as good as it normally would be. So they're having to buy extra feed more than they had anticipated to meet the quality to feed their livestock. So I guess it, altogether we need to uh, try to make this process as easy and fast as possible for our producers. And again, I thank Commissioner Peterson for all the work he put in through the summer, uh, trying to visit with all the people that were affected. And thank you, Representative Sodine, for this bill. And again, uh, I thank you for your time and we, I'd like to show our support again for this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wallen. Um, I think that is all that we have for testifiers. We do have a couple of folks on standby. Um, Allison Vanderwall, Executive Director from Minnesota Cattlemen's Association. It's available for question. Ashley Bress, Paul Hugan, and Sherry Chrome Schreider uh, from MDA are also available for questions. Um, next, I open up the floor for questions from the committee. Uh, and reminder to please be brief in questions and responses. Okay. Uh, Representative Cleve Lauren. Thank you, Madam Chair. And maybe this would be to the commissioner. Um, you know, uh, Commissioner, you and I have had many conversations about how do we get help to those who most need it most. And I think my question to you would be. Um, you know, uh, and listening just to the variety of testimony here, and this is not to take away from the cattlemen at all, that is not my intent, but you know, um, many of our farmers can't move their land anywhere, right? So how do we make sure that we're getting um, the help to those who most need it and to start with those who would have the least cushion to fall back on, right? So uh, are there guardrails in place that would help us make sure that the, the dollars are getting to those who most need it? Commissioner Peterson. Uh, excuse me, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Cleborn, thanks for you know, consistently asking that question. And, you know, I think that's where, you know, uh, my heart is, as Mr. Wollum said, I've tr traveled the state and, uh, you know, I continue to take those questions. You know, I really thank the groups that are very wide variety of groups that you saw testify in this and, uh, you know, and others that are not testifying today that I had conversations with in recent days, including the Farmers Market Association. You know, we rely on our communication groups, you know, uh, to get this out there. You know, that's one of the reasons we have farm groups, we have organizations that they, they do lobbying, but they also do tremendous outreach. You know, we do a good job. Our ag press does a good job. Our community outreach uh, folks do a good job. But um, our organizations are incredibly important partners in this, uh, whether it's uh, making sure that folks are aware of that. Uh, we work with our agricultural media. You know, agriculture is unique in that we have a great um, uh, group of communicators and uh, folks that we work with. And so that is, to me, is, is paramount. This has been out there for a long time, too. I mean, this idea that we have put forward has uh, been out there almost since September. Uh, we have farmers uh, uh, that call us daily almost asking when these grants might be available. So I think folks are aware that this is coming uh, uh, or that it could come, excuse me. And so the, um, the way uh, to the committee has worked to put parameters on, uh, or, uh, or uh, our chair Sundin has uh, by um, if you look at the bill or the DE um, amendment, you know, uh, by putting uh, so much, first of all, into the livestock. Also keep in mind, this is capped, you know, at a $10,000 payment. You, you know, we could move that cap one way or another on what people are going to get, you know. And so I think that is another uh, uh, possibility too as well. Um, but I also just want to note, um, I was just looking at the DE here, uh, you know, on the allocations that 500,000 is reserved for uh, uh, 
especially crop producers who are farmers market vendors. I think that is a really unique uh, spot. We don't have, uh, you know, farms that serve farmers markets. Uh, this is a really unique idea because that are their uh, family size, whatever that means to you. But I think that we, we are trying to be unique in getting those dollars out. We have a good track record of this. We've done this before. Uh, we did it a couple of years ago under the dairy program. And so I'm confident that we'll get those uh, dollars out. Yes, some bigger farms are probably going to get dollars uh, yeah, in this too as well. But, you know, uh, doing this um, uh, this way, I think we are, you know, have opportunities to ensure that this is available to all. Representative Cleveland, follow up. Yes, Madam Chair. And just to be really clear, I have nothing against large, large agricultural producers, right? That, that I don't have a problem with. I just want to make sure that if we have um, farmers who are on the brink of not being able to continue to go on in, in agriculture, that we get the help to them first. And and for those emerging farmers who, you know, this is our first generation farmers as well. We want to make sure that we keep that broad diversity viable going forward. And we understand that, you know, no one has control over a drought. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hopefully my computer is fixed and I can go here. I, I just want to make a comment on some of the earlier testimony. And I hate when farm groups are pitted against each other, different farm groups. A comment was made that crop insurance has made farmers whole from last year. Well, take it from me, uh, it didn't, it doesn't. Uh, crop insurance uh, is expensive and most farmers carry between 60 and 80% coverage on their, their usual or normal yield. So if, for example, a farmer uh, has insurance up to 80%, that leaves that top 20% gone. And that usually represents uh, your profit or most of your profit, all of your profit for the year. So to say that crop insurance made farmers whole last year, uh, in my opinion, is not a truly accurate statement, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you, Representative Anderson. Do you have any further questions or? No, Madam you Chair. Anyone you want to respond? Okay. Uh, Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess this is a, a question for uh, uh, for Commissioner Peterson. Um, uh, I'm very concerned, uh, as you are, with uh, any time lag on this. Uh, we don't want to be in a situation uh, where we're, uh, we're 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 handing out grants to fix drought issues in the middle of a potential flood, uh, spring flood season. And so I share your, I know very real impatience with this. So I guess I just need to understand, uh, I think uh, uh, Chair Sundin has got this right. This needs to get two ways and means on the floor of the house. Uh, and, uh, you know, I appreciate we got uh, Chair Hansen here, uh, but, uh, the DNR stuff, if that's a situation over in another committee, for goodness sakes, I don't want to see in any way, shape, or form uh, this bill delayed even a minute for that. So uh, I don't, I, I, mean, I don't understand uh, what the connection is there with the, with the DNR stuff. Uh, maybe uh, Commissioner Peterson can expound on that a little bit. Commissioner Peterson. Madam Chair and uh, Representative Lewick, um, thank you for the question. And uh, yes, this has been something and, and that uh, I always remind people I'm the Ag Commissioner, but I'm also part of the administration. And so uh, that this was uh, part of a package that we put together um, uh, a while ago, uh, you know, and working through the process and it makes sense to uh, move them together. And I appreciate uh, Chair Sundin working with Chair Hansen and Chair Hansen uh, you know, I think he can talk to uh, his portion of the bill. Uh, basically, we, our bill, which is being introduced today or tomorrow, um, is mirrors this bill. And I, my understanding is the DNR bill that Representative Hansen will be will mirror that and will be in his committee uh, soon. He could speak to that and that we will have it on the floor soon. 
and uh, and the Senate too would be the other piece. You know, I think I appreciate the House is moving this right now and uh, continuing to work. I'm going to be in the Senate here in about an uh, hour and 10 minutes. And uh, we're, uh, you know, moving this. And I think that we can get this out because like I said, we get this done here today is the 15th, 16th, whatever, uh, in the next two weeks. And, you know, target really March 1st and get the checks out before April or the end of March, uh, you know, and start moving that out. I think we'll be fine. But that's, I, I appreciate that. And I think we can do both and uh, move it along. But I do think the egg part of it is important, is critical and needs to move now. That's why I've made it a priority. Mm -hmm. Representative Lewick, follow up. Ah, uh, I appreciate that answer. Yeah, and again, again we got to remember, uh, uh, you know, the, <laughs> sometimes the enemy of getting something done is trying to be perfect. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, so there's an opportunity to move stuff, if so desired, very rapidly through the uh, some of the other committees. Uh, I guess, just to understand the wide breadth of testimony here, we're not talking about uh, stuff that uh, is going to happen. We're talking about people uh, that have had to take uh, uh, pretty, pretty substantial uh, actions uh, that puts them right at the edge of uh, surviving. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, again, I, I, I can't say enough about uh, this thing. Uh, uh, there are real legitimate emergencies out there. If you're sitting there trying to figure out whether or not you're going to be uh, able to continue to operate uh, uh, this spring, uh, that's uh, that's not a very comfortable feeling. And and so uh, even weeks, a week or two delay is, uh, I just uh, have great difficulty tolerating that. Uh, but then again, uh, I come from a different world, I guess. Uh, you, you've been here a long time in the legislature. Uh, uh, occasionally, we have to move uh, and just get the job done. So uh, and I really appreciate that wide breadth of testimony. Uh, I can share uh, just a little bit of, uh, I've got genetics on my farm that go back over 100 years. And that's all I got left on mine. Now, I don't want it in any way compare my situation with the people that have testified because I am no longer a full-time farmer. Uh, but uh, I had to cut that down to the very bare minimum because I had to match what I could keep with the hay. And, and as uh, I believe uh, Mr. Cushel said, uh, I looked at about at best 50% hay production. Uh, uh, and uh, so, and again, I, I'm not, I'm just telling you it's real. And we're not in, the worst is not to come because when you reach the point where you got nothing to feed your cattle, uh, something's got to move. And we're in some cases weeks away for that for some of these people because hay is extremely expensive out there. Uh, and so we've got to get a move on. And again, again I appreciate Chair Sundin, uh, you know, pushing this forward. And if, if we got to break track in the snow, let's get it done. Thank you. So I don't see any more hands. Um, members, the DE1 amendment is before us, but uh, we also have amendments to the DE1 before we make a vote on it. Uh, we'll just go in num numerical order. Uh, Chair Hansen, uh, you have the first two amendments and we'll start with A4. Uh, Chair Hansen, um, go ahead and move your amendment and explain. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, I will not move the A4. Uh, because it's my understanding that uh, that there is similar boilerplate language or what we call boilerplate language uh, in existing law that would cross-reference with this. If, if Commissioner Peterson or Mr. Hugan could just confirm that, would, there would be no need for the A4 amendment. Commissioner Peterson? Uh, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Hansen, Thank you for offering the A4, uh, but I do think that this is uh, uh, pieces that we do uh, as a department uh, when uh, we are uh, able to uh, run checks before checks are cut there, uh, go through a system uh, and we are able to uh, accomplish uh, uh, what you were looking at here in talking to uh, Mr. Hugan. And so I think that, um, you know, I appreciate that you're uh, bringing these uh, pieces forward. 
and uh, making sure that we're being judicious and uh, with uh, taxpayer dollars too as well. So um, Paul, is there anything else to add on the A4 uh, amendment? Mr. Huguenin. Uh, Madam Chair, members, no, I think I think that's accurate. Basically, that, as the commissioner said, that kind of happens behind the scenes automatically when we approve a payment through the SWIFT system. If Department of Revenue has uh, a record that somebody's delinquent in taxes, that is where that gets caught. Uh, Chair Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm not offering the A4. I will move the A5 amendment. Uh, and my intent here, uh, I believe the digital divide is real. Uh, earlier in, the, in today's testimony, we had the ask for having technology. Um, and if we do a first come first serve where it's technology, um, we may run out of the money in those various uh, uh, carve outs that are in the bill. So by having the A5 amendment it provides a five business day uh, period and then if the amount of money that has been requested exceeds uh, those amounts, then uh, it would be randomized. And this is modeled off of deed grants of the Department of Economic Development. Uh, and that provides that there is equity in the system uh, between those that have access, uh, good access. Sometimes there may be access, but it does not work in those that may be in a paper or a non-digital world. So. I would ask for your support for the A5 amendment. And I think uh, I did talk with Commissioner Peterson about this, that this is doable uh, because DEED has done a similar thing with their grant programs. Any questions and comments from the committee members? Uh, Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I have a question. Uh, whether the, the uh, amendment author or Commissioner Peterson can answer this. So I just want to be absolutely unequivocally clear. We still are going to base uh, kind of that major uh, prior to prioritization uh, on what specific element of the of our spectrum of drought uh, uh, classifications are because if we don't want to be just this is a, to just be randomly, I mean, there are certain areas of the state uh, where it was scorched earth and other areas where it was really bad. Uh, and so uh, you, I, you, hopefully you both can reassure me uh, that uh, this in no way is gonna upset that prioritization uh, because if it does, I certainly can't support it. Chair Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Lewick, uh, it's my intent in reading this section, this does not overwrite any of the other criteria that were there, it is uh, uh, in addition, it's an insert, so it doesn't strike. So it's my intent that this, you still would have that prioritization as identified earlier in those carve outs. And that's my reading, um, Commissioner Peterson could correct me if I'm wrong. Commissioner Peterson, do you want to respond? Uh, Madam Chair and members and yeah, no, I'm, <laughs> It's always just uh, different looking at this. Uh, you know, if you look at subdivision two in the DE, uh, the way I was looking at it too, we're uh, looking at, you know, our preference first would be to D4, uh, yeah. which is um, that uh, parts uh, kind of up in north, north central, northwestern Minnesota. Uh, and we would start there and then, uh, and then go into the farms and counties in D3, D2. And that first big pool would be eligible for that, um, and then uh, and then we would do a random uh, because you know just assuming we won't have enough money, uh, you know, in this uh, um, or if we would, I don't know. But that way, uh, you know, everybody would be put together after we did that initial be two point five million. Uh, but we would start, as you can see, in the ranking there with D4 and then work down. Representative Lewick, follow up? No, thank you. I, I just wanted to really understand that because, uh, 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 you know, everybody, everybody's hurting, but like it or not, we've got to make sure that there's some prioritization there. Uh, and, you know, what Mother Nature did to you is uh, uh, that's, that's the first order. And boy, she handed out some... Uh, 
some pretty nasty stuff uh, throughout the state. Thank you. Commissioner Peterson, I saw your hand was up. Did you want to add something? Yeah, you know, I think it is interesting too. Uh, sorry, Madam Chair. And, you know, I think it's interesting too that the timing on this and, you know, what we likely will still be in session after we get the majority of these first uh, um, uh, um, bills and everything by the end of April, we may have a good idea if we're able to move this in the next week or so or and start and get that open. So it, it's likely we could still be in session and know kind of how we're moving some of that around. So it's interesting. It's just a side note I've been kind of thinking about here as we're looking at this. So just wanted to share that. Uh, Chair Sundin, uh, do you have any guidance before we vote on the A5 amendment? Chair, Chair, I think you're muted. Uh, I'd like to thank all the parties involved uh, putting this uh, bill together and uh, this, this particular amendment working on this. And uh, thanks to uh, Representative uh, Loic for uh, asking for clarity on, on the issue. Uh, so thank you for your work, uh, Chair Bang. Uh, uh, and uh, to the amendment, uh, I'll urge a yes vote on this. Okay. I see no further hands. The A5 is before us. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. No. The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Okay. Next, we have uh, Representative Anderson. You have two amendments. Uh, we'll start with the A7 amendment. Um, Representative Anderson, uh, go ahead and move your amendment and explain uh, your, your amendment. Representative Anderson, I think you're muted. Should have learned this by now, huh? Anyway, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this amendment, as you probably all see, uh, goes above the $5 million cap on this portion of the of the, the bill. But since the bill has not uh, received a target yet, and it hasn't been to Ways and Means, and I did discuss this somewhat with, with the chair, and I'm not saying he was uh, enthused about it, but I thought I would put this out anyway. It's a rather small request. And what it does is a lot of the, the aid is going to come from the federal side for hauling in uh, hay and forage from uh, from wherever it came from. But but the hole in that uh, results in that it doesn't cover the first 25 miles of transport. And up in my area of the state, uh, the uh, city at Sock Center on the freeway has a has a large and pretty well-known hay auction. They have it uh, quite often. So again, up there in that Stearns County area, which is you know the top dairy county in the state, a lot of activity, a lot of demand for hay. If a farmer went to that hay auction and purchased hay and he lived within 25 miles of Sock Center, he would not be eligible for the, the federal aid. So what this bill does is just kind of fill in that gap uh, to cover the first 25 miles for the farmer who has to uh, purchase additional hay because of the drought and haul it back home again. So Madam Chair, that's uh, what this amendment does. Okay, um, any questions and comments from the committee? Okay, uh, Chair Sundin, uh, any comments? Before we move on this, uh, I'm just wondering if we could uh, tap into the uh, uh, commissioner again to see what we're doing and what we uh, need to do, I guess. I'd like to some, some more further input. Uh, Anderson? <clears throat> Madam Chair, Representative Sadeen, Representative Anderson, um, we actually think this amendment is a good idea. I think it, uh, 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 Chair Anderson, uh, identifies a good uh, piece that we would likely cover uh, under the RFP and it highlights it. Um, and we think this is a workable, workable piece. Chair Sunday. Uh, Chair Bang, thank you. I just uh, wanted a uh, reaffirmation of, uh, of uh, my thoughts here. So uh, I, I'd recommend yes vote on uh, the A7. Okay. Seeing no further hands, the A7 is before us. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Okay, the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. All right, we have one more last amendment is Representative Anderson, the A8 amendment. Uh, 
please go ahead and move your amendment and explain. Thanks again, Madam Chair. And what this amendment does would uh, delete the first section of the bill, which changes the eligibility requirements for RFA loans. And first of all, I want the committee to know that if at some point we would choose to change those requirements uh, for RFA loans, I have no problem with that. But making what is a fairly major policy change in an agriculture drought aid disaster bill, I don't think is a place to do that. This bill has been on the table since last August, and it comes to us today in the form of a delete all amendment with policy changes in it, or at least this policy change. So I would encourage us to pass a clean bill and uh, look at this policy change at a later date. And you know, I, I just wonder if we think there are not enough farmers out there uh, across the state that would qualify for these loans under the current guidelines, which uh, is a 50% income uh, from farming or non-farming. Well, let's just talk about the funding that this, this bill uh, would be available when it passes. It breaks down to $5 million for rapid response grants and an additional $5 million for the RFA loan program with the stipulation that applications are re relating to the drought the, be given priority. So if these rapid response grants are kept at $5,000, we'll be able to help 1,000 farmers. And if the grants are increased to $10,000, we'll be able to help only 500. My point is that this is a relatively small bill in terms of trying to help as many farmers as possible who suffered the major damages and crop losses and such this past year. And uh, some have had to sell off parts of their herd. But this was devastating for many farmers all across Minnesota last year. And now the 5 million going to the RFA program is a bit different in that at least uh, some of those loan requests I would imagine will be for more than five or $10,000 and some will be for, for less than that amount. It's hard to say how far that $5 million will go, but I, I think we can agree that the need for loans because of last year's drought is much greater than that. So even under the current guidelines for loan eligibility, there are probably far more eligible farmers who could use these loan funds than that $5 million will cover. And I, I don't think this has to do with the size of a farm. We've talked about large farms and small farms. To me, it gets at uh, somebody who makes up to 80% of their income from something other than farming would be eligible for an agriculture disaster loan. And um, you have to judge for yourself uh, on that one. So again, if, if this committee is going to make a change regarding this eligibility, Let's do it uh, the right way. Let's put it in an ag policy bill or even a standalone bill and don't mix it up with this uh, drought aid disaster bill, which needs to get done as soon as possible. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I will open up for questions and comments from the committee. Uh, Representative Cleveland, I saw that your hand was up. Do you still want to ask Thank you, questions? Madam Chair. No, I took it down. Thank you. Uh, Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, I just want to echo uh, 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 Representative Anderson's uh, uh, comments that there's a time and place to make substantial policy changes uh, to the RFA program. And this is not the place. Uh, in fact, this would border on being reckless uh, because we need to, we need to see uh, as best they can project uh, the long-term impact on that entire uh, program, and again, I, this would uh, just be blunt. This this is a reckless uh, way to do policy. So I would I would urge that uh, uh, we leave that alone and eliminate that uh, that section as this amendment would do. Thank you, Chair Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would oppose the Anderson amendment. You know if. If somebody, and I think we had testimony to this, if they're farming and they lost their crop, maybe they had to get a job uh, that was their income last year, that that was their main income. So their percentage of income dropped because they had a crop failure. And so uh, I think the, the way the chair has the DE written for that one year thing rather than three year recognizes the crisis that we've heard everyone talking about. Uh, so I, I think uh, what the Chair Sundin has done is good. Uh, I would oppose, I would encourage a no vote on the amendment because there are gonna be people who had to take, find other income, whatever it was to make ends meet. 
And that's why the percentage could be dropped for one year. During, in this particular disaster aid, I think the testimony was compelling and I am sure there are people out there who had to pick up extra work. Thank you, Chair Hansen. Uh, Chair Sundin, do any guidance before we make a vote? Thank you, Chair Bang. Uh, with all due respect to my colleagues, uh, Representative Anderson, Representative Lewick, uh, these have these issues have been discussed uh, thoroughly going in, uh, putting this uh, bill together and putting uh, uh, gathering input from all the parties that we could. And uh, the recommendations from the department uh, weigh heavily uh, with us. And uh, I'm going to urge a, a no vote on uh, the A7. Okay. Madam Chair. Representative Anderson. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, I don't argue with the fact uh, that that may have been the case this year, although I will say that when somebody realized that uh, their crops were in trouble, it was probably June, July, August, whatever time frame that might have been. So we're looking at uh, off-farm income for less than a year, probably less than half a year to, uh, to get to that threshold. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm, I'm against this. I'm just saying that I don't think a drought disaster bill is a place to make a major policy change. Um, let's do it uh, in a policy bill or a standalone bill. So that, that's, that's my closing comment, Madam Chair. Seeing how this was a, a recommendation from the department, Commissioner Peterson, do you wanna make a comment? Madam Chair and members, I'd love to, yeah. Uh, thanks. No, this has been a great discussion. I think you've hit all the high points. This is actually something that we've looked at for a number of, uh, it's been something we've been talking about uh, quite a bit. Um, we've actually had this proposal um, uh, for a while. We also see farmers that want to get into farming uh, that uh, this may affect uh, too. And so, and then uh, uh, um, Chair Hansen also, or Representative Hansen also brought this up uh, you know, it's something I don't know that there'll be a ton of people that'll use this. And again, it's uh, hitting the loan program, but we have had this come up with, uh, uh, to my knowledge, with some newer farmers that were uh, trying to get into farming. And that was kind of what we were getting at. And they just had to had some issues. So they might be working kind of as Representative Andrew was, Anderson was saying. Um, and as we were looking at this, it might help uh, 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 two or three farmers uh, you know, kind of get uh, get get their feet under them in this uh, situation. So that was kind of the intent of this, and uh, appreciate the discussion on it. Chair Sunday. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Bang. I think I misspoke. Uh, uh, my recommendation was a no vote on the A eight, not the A seven. Sorry. Thank you for that clarification, Chair Sunday. Uh, see no further hands. The A eight. Mm -hmm is before us. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. No. Nay. The motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Okay, there are no more further amendments to the DE1. The DE1 amendment as amended is before us. Uh, reminder, this is not the final vote on the bill. It is just adopting the DE1. And so we could continue the on the discussion on the bill as amend, amended. Uh, so all those in favor of the DE1 amendment as amended signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. No. Nay. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. So House File 3420 as amended is now before us. Uh, any further discussion? Chair Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, as my name was mentioned earlier, uh, we will be putting the governor's uh, DNR and ag bill. It's in the hopper already. It'll be introduced tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, well, yeah, it'll be introduced tomorrow. And then uh, we anticipate a hearing on Tuesday in my committee. So, uh, and then we'll go to ways and means. So I'll be married up with uh, this particular bill be anxiously watching the Senate uh, to see if a bill gets dropped. Right. Uh, 
So thank you to all those who has uh, who have testified. Uh, Chair Sundin, any closing comments before you renew your motion? Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks. This has been a great discussion. I uh, really appreciate all the input uh, from members and testifiers. Uh, and uh, I'm going to get off script here a little bit and uh, share a personal story. Uh, I'm sorry to see that uh, Robert Silton and uh, dairy farmer from uh, my district could not make it here today or wasn't available to testify. But uh, my story is similar to his, very similar to his. The herd is about the same size, uh, a prize herd with uh, good uh, uh, genetics. And uh, my family farm had to uh, ship the herd uh, back year, uh, decades ago because of feed problems. Uh, and uh, it was just a, the most devastating day a farmer could imagine when they, uh, when they have to ship a, a herd and uh, move on to something else. So if we can avoid that uh, with large farmers, small farmers, uh, we should be doing so. So I, I'm hoping this is a strong statement today that uh, we support helping the farmers that are impacted by this drought. Uh, we've taken the time to discuss these measures with the Department of Ag and address members' concerns and uh, make sure that these funds will reach the folks who need it quickly. Keyword, quickly. Uh, I renew my motion that House File 3420, as amended, be recommended to be referred to the Ways and Means Committee, and I ask for your support. My apologies, Chair. Um, I saw that Representative Anderson hand is up, and so I know we still have a good time some time here. So uh, is it okay if I, I'm going to ask uh, Representative Anderson to, to if you still hey, want to hey. make a comment? No, Madam Chair, uh, we've heard uh, the chair's closing comments and I'm not going to go away from uh, committee procedure. So uh, he has a last word and the bill is what it is. And I, I thank him for his work and uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Representative Anderson. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, so the motion is before us. Uh, Mr. Smith, please take the roll. Representative Sundin. Aye. Sundin votes aye. Uh, Representative Vang. Aye. Vang votes aye. Representative Anderson. Anderson votes aye. Anderson votes aye. Representative Burkle. Burkle votes aye. Burkle votes aye. Representative Eklund. Aye. Eklund votes aye. Representative Hanson R. Hanson R. Aye. Hanson R votes aye. Representative Hanson J. Hanson J. Aye. Hanson J. Aye. Representative Cleborne. Cleborne. Aye. Cleborne votes aye. Representative Lippert. Lippert. Aye. Lippert votes aye. Representative Lewick. Lewick votes aye. Lewick votes aye. Representative Miller. Miller. Aye. Miller votes aye. Representative Nelson. Nelson votes aye. Nelson votes aye. Representative Thompson. 12 ayes, zero nays, Madam Chair. There being 12 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails and the House file 3420 as amended is on its way to ways and means. Uh, Chair Sunday, I'll return the gavel back to you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for pitching in. Now that concludes the agenda for today. Uh, a special thanks to all the testifiers today. Uh, and our next meeting will be Monday at this regular time. This meeting's adjourned.